But here we have our clutch presenters. A big thank you to Wayne and David Madison for stepping in last minute for us tonight. They're biologist brothers that grew up as two free-range kids exploring nature, science, and art. Please give them a warm welcome to David Madison, Grand Beetle Madison, and Dr. Wayne, the Jumping Spider Guy Madison. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we are the two free-range kids. Uh, I'm Wayne Madison. I'm a biologist at UBC. And I'm David. I'm a biologist at Oregon State University. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, we both say that. We say, I'm a biologist at, and that's usually how we present ourselves. In the context of biology, I often think that I'm an imposter because I'm really a, an artist who pretends like he's a biologist. If I was in the context of artists, I'd probably feel that I was an imposter in the opposite way, so it's a great chance to have a double imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> so we, we just were asked, Teresa, thank you, uh, for asking us yesterday about this, and so we had no talk at all. We've been formulating this over the last day, and uh, David luckily came north. He was coming north anyways. Um, and so what we want to talk to you today about uh, is basically how we grew up uh, responding to nature with both science and art. And um, the reason we think it's important is because uh, we see that it's had a big influence on how we grew as scientists and how we grew as science communicators. Um, because uh, by thinking about how we grew up, I think it can affect how we think about how to bring people into science. And I think you're going to see resonances between what we say and what Curtis said. Um, uh, but also, it can help bring more unique perspectives into science itself. So we, we uh, were born in London, Ontario, and spent our early days... Yes. By the way, in case it's not obvious, we're twins. Yes. So we had the luxury back in the 60s and 70s of being free-range kids. Our parents let us just explore nature in the neighborhoods we were in. Whoa. So that started out in the gardens in London, Ontario, of our little house. And behind this house was a vacant lot. Uh, one seminal moment in our history was when Wayne discovered a trilobite fossil in a pile of, of rocks in, the, in that vacant yard. We would always be looking at natural objects. This is me on a beach in Lake Huron. I like to think I'm looking at a beetle right there. We spent a lot of time at a cottage in the Muskoka regions, and we would just wander around and just see what was out there in the our dad liked to fish and he would, he inspired us to be more interested in the natural world in part by engaging us in collecting bait. And during this time, especially when we were, became 13 years old to 15 years old, we fell in love with particular groups of organisms. Uh, Wayne fell in love with jumping spiders and I fell in love with a group of beetles called ground beetles. And, uh, of course, we did what young people do that are interested in groups. We bought books, we looked at things, we tried to learn a little bit. But one of the strongest responses we had was to do drawings, to basically capture our understanding and our enthusiasm for these organisms through drawings. These are the oldest drawings that I have that still survive uh, from when uh, we were 14 years old. These are some of the jumping spiders that I worked on. Uh, and uh, as the years went on, the, I just hit the middle button. Yep. Uh, the drawings got better. Uh, uh, um, technically, they're more accurate. Uh, they took a lot longer. Um, and this continued uh, uh, as our careers went along. So when you look at these, drawings. They are technical drawings. They show the faces of particular species of jumping spiders. There are a lot of diagnostic details you could use to try to identify these things. But there's a, a, a gratuitous care 
gratuitous in the scientific sense that goes beyond just what we needed to communicate for the diagnostic details. We thought that these little creatures were beautiful, so we wanted to put that beauty into the art as well. We wanted to communicate that. We wanted to celebrate. And I think if you think about how you respond to nature, there's an emotional and aesthetic component, and then there's the component of understanding and interpretation, which you might think of as the science part, right? Well, everybody has both, even scientists, they have both responses, but we get trained to throw away the aesthetic and emotional one and only report on the understandings and interpretations and the data. Well, we started in this before anybody told us that. We didn't know we weren't supposed to care about these things and communicate the beauty as well, so we did. And we think that that's actually one of the most important things about how we grew up. Um, as we continued, even into publishing this work and so forth, we continued to incorporate a sense of beauty, not because it, we thought of ourselves as artists, but because we wanted to. We wanted to celebrate these creatures. So, in effect, by being a little community of two people, working together as scientists and talking to one another, somewhat isolated and certainly premature before we got to university, we were able to develop our relationship to the subject on our own terms, and those terms included both art and science. So as Wayne was going through this path, I was going through the same path, and the works that we did, the artistic works we did, were done with the materials we had at hand, which consisted primarily of Laurentian pencil crayons, some inks, and uh, some paints. And the, the style that we used, the mixed media, we just did what seemed to make sense at the time. Um, this, is, this is the earliest one I have from when I was 18. And this is the first one I did on the beetles that I grew to love, ground beetles. For a while there, I was actually a scientific illustrator for, for a year. And I was doing other things for other people by commission. But then I transitioned to do my master's degree on a particular group of beetles called Bambidion. And just as Wayne was mentioning in his scientific publications, I too wanted to convey what I viewed as the aesthetic beauty of these organisms, even in the drawings that were really pretty sterile in some ways, and communicating details of male genitalia of the beetles, which is what the bottom one is all about. And uh, uh, right, okay. So, so that was my art with the art. A very important component of all of this, both in terms of the methodological development and inspiration, came from our mother. Um, our mother, a housewife, was a one-woman band who ran the household and was, is fearless in terms of solving problems. If she's got a problem, if she's got some issue, she just figures out a way to do it. And she has no lack of confidence in her ability to do, do whatever it needs to be done. And she, Wayne and I are both very thankful that she conveyed that belief in ourselves um, to us. There's a song that called The Cape. I don't remember who wrote it, but Eric Bibb sings it. It's got one of the most beautiful lines in any song, which is, he did not know he couldn't fly, and so he did. Um, and that was the environment we grew up with, with our mom. And even to this day, so this is, here she is at 82 years old, collecting beetles with me in Jasper National Park, sucking them up just like a champ. Right, so um, we would also, as teenagers, we were, were nerds too, uh, you might have guessed that. Uh, we would be dropped off at the University of Guelph Library for the whole day. It was the most exciting day for us when we get dropped off. Our parents went to visit relatives and we just spent all day photocopying books in the library of beetles and spiders. And, <laughs> In the process of doing this, we were mainly dealing with the older literature in which there were a lot of naturalists and people who were also one-man bands uh, who basically did everything they needed to do to convey 
information about biodiversity to the world. And one of my heroes that was very inspiring to me was Carl Indro, who was a beautiful illustrator. He both illustrated and wrote this book on the family of beetles I work on in Canada and Alaska. It's, in a, it's a thousand page work fully illustrated by his own hand. So, as I said earlier, and as David's shown through his images, we've continued, as we've continued to publish, uh, to incorporate beauty into our science. And we often have done that just by how we formulated illustrations. Um, here, uh, some of mine. Here's some of David's. Um, also in websites and computer programs and so forth. Um, it's really mattered to us to be appealing, but also to have our emotions on show. Uh, as Curtis said, it's important to let the emotional side of science come through because that's how you're going to reach people. That's how people who don't have the native geekness about a particular topic, how they can start uh, to relate to it is that by working um, on our own, we found a way to enjoy the science without uh, being told we couldn't do things. David mentioned that as well. Um, uh, we are a little bit worried about the current day. And there's some things that, you know, something like this is about connections. But our isolation also helped us. Kids aren't free range these days. They aren't able to explore on their own. Um, at not nearly so much, so will they have their chance to develop their personal relationship with the subject, not just the relationship that's dictated by the groups around them, the connections of people they have. Uh, I've seen people who are in science who seem to be so focused on the social connections. Science as social medium in some ways is a good thing, but in other ways could be bad because if your focus is entirely on the social connection, then your relationship, your link to external reality is not your primary focus. And suddenly, the focus on the truth might not be so strong. And I think that's what we see, for instance, in certain politicians south of the border. <laughs> so another issue that, uh, that we feel lucky with is that in our own little isolation, uh, our ability to develop this relationship with the subject ourselves and express them in both art and science is that one of the core things that I worry about in the modern age is with the internet, with social media, young kids are inundated with information. There's so many that they, it's very hard for them to develop their own personal voice uh, uh, to speak with. And so um, there's both the advantage of freedom that we had, but also the constraints just because of the lack of existence of things like the internet. So I think any of you that know anything about population genetics and the way evolution works, know that the size of the population, and there's how many independent actors there are with their own little genetic material participating, plays a role in how efficient evolution happens. The bigger it is, the more efficient evolution happens, the more variability that natural selection can select on. Well, science is a similar thing. The more unique perspectives that come into it, the more chance there's going to be of that best perspective coming to the fore. And so a lot of what we said, I think, by blending in our own personal nature into the science, by seeing it from an artistic way, which is unique and personal, we think that we were able to bring a unique perspective to some of our work that had we not had that development time where we could develop our own perspective, might not have come up the same way. So I think one of the, the messages that we want to say is, Encourage people to explore on their own. And if you can teach a kid by not teaching them, that's probably a good thing. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I didn't, didn't get into academia really young. 
Well, we did. I mean, our, our, you know, when we finished high school, when we went to university, that was standard. Yeah. But we started making contact with scientists and going to scientific conferences young. young. Yeah. So, so even before you were in university, you yeah. were going to conferences and interacting with scientists? My first, well, my first, my first conference was when I was in first year university. But my first letter to a scientist that got responded to would have been 1973, and I think for David too. Mine was 74, and that, uh, that, that's another part of the story. So, when, sorry, when we were like 15 or 16. Yeah. I wrote a, a letter to this famous biologist who worked on these beetles, not expecting a response, and I got an eight-page response back. <laughs> and that played a major role in just completely hooking me. So mentorship was important. Mentorship was very important. Yeah, it was, I mean, for us, it was really quite a blend, right? We had this chance on our own to develop a trajectory, but then the mentorship is what guided us to eventually, you know, do it right and blend into the conversation that is science. 